safety and a lot of questions about making sure that you're opening your businesses safely and really wanting to make sure that you keep yourselves, your staff and your customers safe. So the intention of the session today is trying to make sure that you have the answers uh, that you're looking for and have an opportunity for a question and answer period with the health unit to answer any of those questions that have been uh, waiting for you. So uh, just a brief introduction slide here. This is what our agenda looks like for this morning. I'm going to do uh, a brief introduction of your hosts and the partners who have pulled this together. Uh, I want to talk to you really quickly about what economic recovery in Corth Lakes looks like to date. And then we're really just gonna jump into it for the reason that you're all here is we're gonna pass it over to Richard from the health unit for a presentation on operating your business safely. Uh, following that, we're gonna have a question and answer forum. We're gonna have the opportunity for answering the questions that were pre-submitted. So a number of you had uh, emailed questions that you wanted to make sure were touched on today. So Richard's gonna go through those first and then we will answer any of your questions following that. And then at the end, we're gonna do a quick poll just to get your feedback on the session and a wrap up on that. Uh, so to start, I'm Carly. Uh, I'm with the Economic Development Department with the city. We have a number of other partners and I've got their logos here in just a second. Uh, but first some housekeeping, uh, housekeeping notes, please keep your uh, microphones muted. It just makes sure that we don't have any background noise and you can hear the presenter really clearly. If you do have questions, feel free to start submitting them in the chat box. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a moderated discussion where we'll be using the chat box as the forum of, uh, to take your questions. And then one last piece is uh, this session is being recorded and we will make it available on the city's website following uh, today. So the partners for today, we've got the City of Kortha Lakes Economic Development Team, the Kortha Lakes Small Business and Entrepreneurship Center. We have uh, the health unit as well as all of our uh, chambers of commerce in Fenland Falls, Bob Cajun, uh, Lindsay, Cobalconk, New Orleans, as well as the Lindsay Downtown BIA. So what you see on your screen here, those are the, the people that came together and recognized that this was a session that was really important for you and made sure uh, that we were able to get the word out and uh, get you logged in today. So thank you. Uh, briefly, uh, economic recovery in Kortha Lakes. The uh, City of Kortha Lakes is, is committed to supporting you both during and in recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. And recovery takes a number of different forms. And so the first is the economic recovery task force uh, that is being led by uh, mayor and council uh, that is in place and working on implementing a number of priorities. Underneath that, we've got economic recovery task force working groups uh, that are made up of 10 different sectors across the city, our, our sort of main um, industry sectors, where we've had direct input from business owners like yourselves who uh, are feeding some information to the task force on what economic recovery initiatives are necessary. We have Team Kortha Lakes, which is a round table of about 16 different business organizations that are here to support uh, local businesses. And uh, again, looking at what their clients and members are uh, currently going through and coming up with different initiatives to support you, as well as sort of off at the kickoff of uh, COVID-19, there's been a number over 500 business interviews and surveys that our team has conducted. And from all of those different groups, we're hearing really clearly that uh, safety and uh, sort of proper health and safety is really important to all of you, which led us to having this session with you this morning. So um, we'll have the opportunity at the end of the session to ask you for some feedback if there's some other sessions that are really important to make sure that your business is moving forward in this time uh, please enter those in the chat box and we'll, we'll do what we can to to keep bringing you uh, relevant and important information so that's it for me uh, quick and i'm going to pass it off to richard who is the manager of health protection at the halliburton kortha pine ridge district health unit 
Uh, Richard has worked in public health for 24 years, both in Alberta and now in Ontario. He's been working with the HKPR Health Unit for the past 17 years as the manager of health protection. And in this role, he's responsible for things like food safety, uh, rabies, vector-borne diseases like mosquito and tick surveillance, and a number of different programs. And so I'm going to pass the mic over to Richard and he's going to start running through his uh, presentation and then we will, uh, I'll be back to support you through the chat group. Okay, big thank you to Kara, Carly, uh, Sandy, and all of the partners and all everybody that uh, has joined us uh, today. So thank you very much for having us uh, present to you today. Hopefully you will find the, the session uh, useful. And if you have any questions that we can't get to, uh, just jot them down, send them to Carly, and uh, we'll get you a response as soon as we can. Uh, so Carly, can you see the presentation? I can, yeah. Perfect. Just gonna open up the, there we go. Okay. So as Carly mentioned, uh, my name is Richard Ovcharovic. I'm uh, one of the managers for uh, public health or uh, the health protection team here. And uh, uh, I've been working on this COVID-19 uh, uh, issue for, since it, uh, since it be began. Uh, I'm responsible for a number of public health inspectors that provide uh, information and uh, support as, as well as uh, education and enforcement of the emergency regulations that we have in place. So the topics that we're going to cover today are the same topics that uh, Carly mentioned earlier on. We're going to talk about what does it mean, what does stage three mean to, uh, to your business and the health unit. Uh, we're going to talk about supporting safe interaction between businesses and customers, um, ensure that your business is in compliance with the mask requirement, uh, know what to do when there is a COVID-19 uh, case or a contact in your workplace. And then we will, we're going to take some uh, questions uh, after that. So first disclaimer, uh, the presentation was uh, prepared as of July 24th. So there's continuous changes and things that are happening with respect to the COVID-19 uh, uh, file. Uh, but we uh, included all of the information from July 24th when the new Reopening Ontario Act came into effect. And please note that this presentation is intended for uh, education and it's not legal advice. We, we do um, check with our legal department as much as possible, um, but it is, uh, if, you, if you need further legal advice, you might want to consult with your uh, attorneys. So a little bit of a background, uh, the government of Ontario declared a provincial emergency back on March 17th, 2020. The emergency was declared under the authority of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. And the uh, declaration of emergency was extended and is currently in effect until tomorrow. Um, on July 24th, the government of Ontario enacted the reopening of Ontario, uh, flexible response. Act, which uh, ends the emergency, but it gives the uh, government certain powers, and we'll co cover that later on. And currently, we're in stage three of phase two recovery. And I have a nice little slide that will show you the timelines and, and we, where we actually sit with respect to, to that. So, uh, if, you, if you remember, stage one was where uh, everything was locked down. Um, stage two, we started reopening certain businesses and certain gatherings. So we're right about here uh, in stage three on the purple mark there, purple arrow. Uh, so that's restarting the businesses. And depending on how things go with respect to the number of cases that we have, um, we're hopefully going to be moving into uh, phase three and long-term recovery. So what does stage three actually mean? 
Halliburton Kwartham District Health Unit was among the 24 health units that moved to stage three in July, on July 17th. And as a result, City of Corth Lakes, Halliburton County, and Northumberland County all fall under the City of Corth Lakes, uh, oh, sorry, all fall under the Halliburton Corth District Health Unit jurisdiction. Therefore, all of those municipalities were able to move into stage three, which uh, allowed the reopening of more businesses. Actually, most of the businesses are now reopened with some, uh, some limitations. So there's uh, gathering limits and there's uh, other things that, have, that were put in place. Um, there is still some high risk venues uh, and high risk businesses um, that remain closed. And uh, also the indoor and outdoor gathering limits, although they have increased from 10, uh, they're still restricted for a number of different uh, businesses. So generally it's 50 indoors, 100 outdoors, unless stated otherwise in the regulation. The uh, health unit established a call center uh, to assist public and business owners with questions. We did that right at the uh, onset of the uh, declared emergency and our staff have actually been seconded from their uh, routine work and they have been working seven days a week for a uh, number of months. Uh, we just reduced those, uh, those hours uh, recently, but uh, at, the, at the onset of it, uh, we had a number of staff uh, that worked the call center seven days a week to provide support uh, to people that that uh, had questions, businesses that had questions, uh, etc. We also created, uh, well, we have a website, but we created uh, additional resource information on our website that is uh, that provides information on COVID nineteen. Uh, so you'll find the most up-to-date information on number of cases that we have in, uh, in our region, divided by uh, City of Corth Lakes, Halliburton, and Northumberland County. It provides resources that are downloadable. Uh, so those are the resources like the signs. Uh, there's a number of other uh, how-tos and uh, information that you can utilize in your own workplaces. And then there is uh, Q and A's, questions and answers. So throughout the entire uh, pandemic from March 17th, we have uh, received number of questions and the questions that have repeated, uh, been repeatedly asked, we've created the Q and A and those Q and A's are posted on our, uh, on our web website. So if there is questions that we don't get to today, I would urge you to go visit our website uh, take a look at it and go through the resources. Uh, it has a lot of good links in there as well. Oops, go back. We also work with uh, the Ontario Provincial Police, municipal police, uh, municipal police services, and the municipal bylaw to enforce the rules as per the emergency regulations. So it may be any one of those um, entities that is deployed to respond to complaints, um, provide education, and ensure uh, progressive enforcement of the regulations that are set. As I mentioned, initially the um, uh, emergency was declared under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. And as of Friday, uh, the Reopening Ontario Flexible Response to COVID-19 Act was uh, enacted and there's 36 regulations under the uh, above mentioned act so they were initially identified under and, and created under the emergency management civil protection act they have since been moved to uh, uh, under, under the reopening act and there, there's few things about the uh, the second act the reopening act that I just wanted to highlight so ordered issue, orders that were issued, as I mentioned, are still in effect and they will continue to be in effect for, uh, sorry, the, the reopening Ontario Act is in effect for a year and then it's gonna be reviewed. 
the orders under the act, 36 different orders, are have to be reviewed and commented on by the premier or within 30 days and every 30 days. So there is a continuous review of what's happening in the, in the community, what's happening in Ontario and what's happening in Canada uh, to make sure that we don't go too fast or we don't go too slow. Uh, too fast can, can, you know, if we reopen too fast, we can get back into a, a more pandemic state where we have a significant number of outbreaks. If we uh, hold off too long and, and be too restrictive, it, it'll have an effect on the economy and uh, our businesses. The rules continue to change, uh, requiring continuous review and reassessment. So if you can just imagine the, um, the volume of information that has been coming through uh, to myself and, and our staff and all of the, the uh, agencies that have been uh, looking at uh, and, and enforcing the, uh, the rules that are in place, those rules have been changing almost on a weekly basis. So it continues continuous uh, vigilance on our part to make sure that we're up to date and we provide the most up to date information to uh, to you, uh, the municipalities, and the callers. And just to highlight here that the local medical officer of health has the authority to set additional restrictions requirements that are legally binding under uh, both of those acts, and that's where the masking requirement comes into effect. So as I mentioned, there's a number of different uh, activities that are considered high risk and are still closed under stage three. The amusement parks and water parks, buffet style food services, dancing at restaurants and bars, other than hired performers with restrictions, uh, overnight stays at camps, some private karaoke rooms, sports with prolonged or deliberate contact, such as wrestling, judo, those kind of uh, sports, uh, saunas, steam rooms, bathhouses, and, and oxygen bars, and table games at casinos and gaming establishments. So those are all still considered high risk and they're not approved to open at this time. Some of the restrictions that are in the regulation uh, are a little, little more stringent than what a business or a, uh, an operator of a, a special event or some sort of an event can, um, can do. And, and certain events can be done safely, but are, they're, they're still restricted uh, and, and uh, either by number of people that can attend or by uh, the sheer fact that they're named in the regulation. So, uh, the government has created an opportunity for pro uh, proposals to be submitted uh, for exemptions. And those proposals go directly to the chief, uh, the office of the chief medical officer, officer of health. They're reviewed and then they're commented on whether or not th those events can, can happen. So uh, locally we've had our Lindsay exhibition as uh, wanting to put on an event. They have a number, uh, number of buildings. But the way that the regulation is written, the caveat of 50 people indoors or 100 people outdoors applies to the entire facility. So it doesn't really make much sense. So the um, proposal uh, is uh, an avenue where the organizers can submit their proposals uh, and you have to be as detailed as possible to, to identify the uh, uh, protective measures that you've put in place. In order for us to move and continue moving safely into uh, further reopening, uh, we encourage people to continue uh, with the important public health messages that we've had initially. So they don't stop at stage three. Uh, we got to continue with physical distancing, washing hands, staying home with ill. Those are the top three. Uh, work from home if possible. Uh, not all businesses are going to be able to do this, but there is a number of different organizations 
uh, that can work safely from home. And if, if that's possible, then you can do that. Limit indoor gathering to maximum of 50 and outdoor maximum of 100 people. Wear, wear face coverings. <clears throat> whenever you're indoors or in an area where physical distancing is, uh, is a challenge. Routinely clean high touch surfaces. Minimize travel and isolate for 14 days after international travel. So this requirement is actually a federal requirement. Download the COVID alert app when launched to be notified if you were in contact with anyone that has COVID-19. So this, uh, this app, uh, is going to be launched really soon and the, the wor way that it works is anybody that signs up if you're tested uh, you get a 10 digit number with your results you input that number into the device and it alerts anybody that also has uh, the app downloaded that they were in, in close contact with uh, what the individual who works on bluetooth and all of the personal uh, information has been uh, is, is erased so there is no personal information shared or personal health information other than the fact that there's someone close by that has uh, had tested positive for COVID and uh, we continue to um, promote the testing of individuals uh, whenever they were in contact with uh, COVID-19 case So with respect to uh, supporting safe interactions, um, there's a number of things that uh, employers and staff need to do. First of all, all staff must self-monitor to ensure that uh, they're not ill. And if they do have any symptoms of, of illness, they need to stay home. That's the best way to protect uh, your colleagues and your clients. So we're asking, uh, all of the businesses to post COVID-19 screening signage in plain view at the entrance of your facilities. And the signs are downloadable, they're on our website, and I do believe that uh, they were shared with uh, all of the businesses with the assistance of uh, economic development and our local chambers of commerce. So thank you for that assistance. Actively screen all employees for COVID-19 symptoms and any employees showing signs or reporting symptoms should immediately be sent home and advised to get tested. This is the best way to, once again, keep people safe. So there is a, I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen this uh, inverted triangle. Uh, this is from Ministry of uh, Labor, but Whenever we're dealing with hazards, there is different ways of uh, dif different uh, control measures that can be put in place. The most effective control measure is eliminating the hazard. So by having people stay at home when they're sick or physical di physically distancing, you're eliminating the potential of that uh, virus being inhaled and uh, infecting yourself, your coworkers, or your clients. Substitution is, is not really applicable in this case. Substitution is more uh, when you're dealing with chemicals or other hazards. But in, um, in the public health setting, as we're dealing with the emergency right now, it's not something that, uh, that we need to, uh, we, we, can, we can employ. The next section, which is a little bit, uh, and another important section here is engine, engineering controls. This is where you can implement uh, separations, plexiglass, or other uh, engineered controls to prevent people from getting too close to you. Then you have your administrative controls. Uh, these are things like training sessions that employers can do, uh, policies around working from home, uh, environmental cleaning, um, policies on wearing masks, and that kind of stuff. And then you have your personal protective equipment, which is masks, face shields, and any or gloves, any other personal protective equipment that you might have. It's not one or the other. It's the combination of the different controls that help in reducing the exposure to the, um, to the hazard, okay? So for management and staff, and I've talked about it, so I'm just 
quickly going to go through this. Uh, some of the recommendations maintain physical distancing. You might want to consider redesigning your space and interaction and review your flow management uh, in your business. Wash hands frequently. Uh, have uh, hand sanitizer at the entrance and exit of your establishment. And uh, you might want to have it in the lunchroom and in other areas. Ensure that your hand sanitizer is at least 60% alcohol. Frequently clean and disinfect equipment and high touch surfaces. So high touch surfaces are like your door handles, uh, telephones, could be kiosks, a uh, number of different things, washrooms. And follow sector specific workplace safety guidance. I've also included the link in, uh, in here and because there is a number of different sectors that are online here, uh, the, the province of Ontario has created uh, dozens of these uh, sector specific guidance documents. Uh, and it'll walk you through uh, very specifically on what each business should be uh, considering uh, when opening up and working during COVID-19 pandemic. We, uh, we want to ensure that uh, in the business you wear masks or face coverings when working indoors and in areas where public have access to. And especially if the uh, space is tight, you're not able to keep the two meter distance from one another. Consider requiring customers to book appointments to promote physical distancing and flow management uh, and to assist us with contact tracing. So whenever we have um, an incident or a case uh, of COVID-19, our public health uh, staff do a thorough contact tracing to see who else was exposed to the individual. And having that information assists us and we can get to it faster, therefore limiting the number of people that are exposed again. If possible, you might want to consider assigning seats whenever possible to ensure physical distancing. Uh, you've seen in stores and businesses, the floor markings uh, to, to promote the distancing and post signs informing the public to stay home when ill. Stay home uh, for 14 days when we're returning from international travel. Post signs and actively inform patrons of the directive from the Medical Officer of Health wear masks. So we'll talk about masks a little bit later on, but this is one of the uh, questions that we continue to get about what is my responsibility? Do I need to stop people from entering my business? And I'm just going to stop here and say no. The only requirement, legal requirement that business owners have is there's, there's actually six requirements in that order and we'll talk about it, but one of them is if somebody enters your facility and does not have a mask, there might be a reason why they can't wear a mask. Um, so the only responsibility you have is to actually uh, just advise them of the uh, directive issued by the medical officer of health to wear a mask. And that's where your legal obligation ends. Um, once again, physical distancing, some engineering measures like plexiglass, training, and masks for PPE. Part three, we get into uh, the wearing of masks. Um, Dr. Noseworthy, who's the medical officer of health uh, for the Halliburton Court of Finance Health Unit, has issued the directive to commercial establishment under the authority of the uh, Emergency Municipal Civil Protection Act. And in, uh, this was done in an effort to ensure continued successful reopening and to safeguard against COVID-19 in the community. As we look uh, internationally, there's uh, a lot of work that has been done and the countries that have been effective in reducing and, and curtailing the spread of COVID-19 have all had the requirement for wearing masks. Um, I got a little mask, a fashionable mask, I guess. Um, and here that I just wanted to show you. 
Uh, masks can be a variety of different masks that uh, people can wear. Uh, they're the non-medical masks. So remember I mentioned the six requirements identified in the order. The first few are standard and they, they haven't changed from when the pandemic began on March 17th. So ensure effective public health measures are in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And, and those are the ones that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Two, implement screening practices for employees and members of the public, including requiring those who are ill to stay home and be advised to be tested for COVID-19. Three, have a written policy in place requiring persons entering the uh, indoor place or business or facility to wear a non-medical mask or face covering. So the health unit has provided templates of these uh, policies that, that you can utilize. And if you haven't received it, uh, you can reach out to us and we'll, we'll send it to you. Those were sent in a package uh, with the assistance of our economic development, uh, BIA and, uh, and our uh, other municipal partners there. So mask or face coverings must be worn inside at all times on, until the individual is seated to receive the service and is able to maintain two meter distance. So policy will be enacted and enforced in good faith. There's a lot of question about how do we enforce it and used as an opportunity to educate about the use of non-medical masks or face coverings. Another requirement that's identified in the uh, directive is to post signage indicating that non-medical masks or face coverings are required inside the place of business or the facility. And once again, those signs are downloadable from our uh, website and they have been shared already with most of the businesses. Ensure all employees are aware of the policy. So there's a training requirement to make sure that uh, all of your employees are aware of the policy. They're all aware of the requirements. Uh, and then lastly, uh, actively inform patrons of the directive uh, that was issued to wear the mask. And that's what I was talking about. So you don't have to stop individuals from entering your facility. You only have to advise them of the directive. There is some exemptions under in, in that document in, in the directive that was issued. So there is uh, any child under two years of age or a child that's under five, both chrono either chronologically or developmentally. And it is either unwilling or unable to wear a mask uh, is exempt from the requirements from, of wearing a mask. Any person that's in, incapacitated and unable to remove their mask without assistance is exempted. Any other medical reason, uh, whether it's respiratory disease, cognitive difficulties, or difficulty hearing or processing information is not required to wear a mask. And no, there is no requirement for a doctor's note. And then any religious reason. I really don't know uh, how many re religions uh, prohibit masks, uh, but this has been added through the legal, uh, through our legal department to make sure that uh, we don't discriminate any, against anyone. Question we all often get is, are staff required to, ma to wear masks? Uh, so yes, staff are, uh, required to, to have uh, to wear a mask if they interact with clients or work in areas where, where public have access to and can maintain that two meter distance. So if staff, sorry, if public enters a, a public space indoors and your staff is working in that public space, your staff is required to wear a mask. Now, obviously in a shift that's eight to 12 hours long, uh, masks of all types will become uh, damp or soiled. So there is a need for uh, replacement of those masks whenever they get uh, either damp or, or uh, soiled to make it easy to breathe and, uh, 
and, and continue to have them uh, dry and clean uh, for your staff. Now, I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple things. We've had really good response from most of the businesses and most of the community. So people uh, usually come on, on various ends of the spectrum. Either they're very scared and are, are very much for masking or they're really opposed. So it's a very polarizing issue, but about 80, 85, 90% of the people that we've talked to so far, um, even, even if they don't agree that it's necessary, are willing to comply. In order for the masking uh, requirement to be effective to protect uh, the population, we need a, at least 80% compliance. Now the mask, the non-medical masks are not there to protect the wearer of the mask. It's not a medical mask where, where it has those kind of cores, but it is designed to uh, limit the amount of uh, moisture or, or spit or whatever you want to call it um, that is being produced by the individual. So you put a mask on and most of the, the respiratory droplets that are happening are ending up in the mask and they're not being able to be uh, emitted into the environment. So when you have both parties the staff member wearing a mask and the client wearing a mask, all of a sudden you've reduced your exposure significantly. Okay. Now we have had some instances of uh, certain individuals uh, or some businesses that have expressed that they would not be uh, following the, the rules and just wanted to uh, clarify that we have been in consultation with Ministry of Labor and uh, we've been advised that in order under section 25 2H of the Occupational Health and Safety Act could be issued by the Ministry of Labor Inspector when there is non-compliance with the directive issued by the Medical Officer of Health that requires the wearing of masks or face coverings to protect the worker. So the joint inspections with uh, our inspectors and Ministry of Labor inspectors have been arranged to address uh, complaints of non-compliance. Uh, consider changing the staff assignment or oh, some other things that employers can do uh, to, if, if, your, if your staff are unable to wear a mask uh, due to uh, health conditions or, or one of those issues that were exemptions that was identified. So you might want to consider changing their assignment to an area where there is no contact with public, if at all possible, or you might want to consider other protective measures such as face shields, but only for the staff that are unable to wear the masks. Now, I just want to clarify that face shields are not as effective as masks. So uh, there is a body of evidence that suggests that if you're going to have a face shield, uh, it protects your eyes from uh, being able to, from, from getting uh, uh, the virus uh, through, through that uh, process, but it doesn't uh, protect your ability to inhale it. So if there is wearing of uh, uh, face shields, the face shields are uh, to be below uh, your chin and kind of curved to the side to provide as much uh, protection as possible. Okay, fourth part is what to do when there's a case of COVID in your workplace. So anyone that's confirmed or suspected of COVID-19 must, re must refrain from work. Once again, it's that uh, hierarchy that we talked about and eliminating the hazard. Symptomatic staff should be referred for testing and those that test negative need to stay off work until at least 24 hours after sim symptoms uh, resolve. Okay, if you're sim symptomatic, you get tested and you're negative for COVID, you still stay home for 24 hours 
until after, after symptoms resolve. Anyone that tests positive is required to stay home for 14 days from the date that the symptoms began. Uh, individuals that are uh, experiencing illness must self-isolate at home. Any close contacts should immediately take uh, the online COVID-19 self-assessment tool, and there is a link in here directly to the tool. So as we share this uh, presentation, you'll be able to access that well, quite readily. And contact may also be uh, contacted by the health unit. So this is part of our contact tracing measures. Anyone that is a case uh, is automatically contacted and we do our contact tracing and it all depends on the uh, amount of information that our staff are provided by the individual to be able to conduct a, a really thorough and prompt contact tracing with individuals that may have been at risk. Once again, employers should stress physical distancing, wearing masks, cleaning uh, and disinfecting high touch surface. So we've kind of finished the presentation and I got a few questions in here that we've received yesterday. So uh, Carly, uh, maybe we, we can start with those. That's great, thank you. Okay. So first question, what kind of cleaner should be used to wipe down plastic tables, chrome chairs, uh, the individual needs uh, something that won't stain upholstery uh, or carpet. Easy to use and won't hurt the, the hands of the person cleaning. Um, COVID-19 can survive on various different surfaces for, for varying different times. It depends on the surface. It depends on the environmental conditions, indoors and outdoors. Uh, it usually doesn't survive longer than 72 hours. And it's, it can be killed quite readily with uh, cleaners and disinfectants. So below the link here, I have uh, included a chart with various different uh, disinfectants and how to pre uh, prepare those disinfectants. So uh, you, can, you can click on that. And also the only dis disinfectants that, uh, that should be used are ones that have drug identification number because they're the ones that, that were approved by Health Canada for use in Canada. Like I mentioned, it's not just disinfectants that need to be used. You can use cleaners, you can use disinfectants, you can use disinfectant wipes are also effective. Uh, the last uh, link I have down here uh, provides also additional information from Public Health Ontario. So you can, you can click on that. Question two. If you have a medical condition and can work and cannot wear, wear a mask, do we have to ask for a doctor's note? So I kind of covered that in the presentation, but no, uh, no one is uh, required to disclose their, their medical condition, uh, why they're not wearing a mask. It's recognized that there's a variety of reasons why people can't wear masks. And we just ask people to be uh, nice to each other out there. You know, we don't need to stigmatize anybody. Uh, we do want people to wear masks uh, as much as possible to protect one another, protect your customers, protect uh, individuals in the public. But uh, there, there might be additional reasons why people can't wear masks. What do businesses do if a customer or staff member seems uh, to be ill with COVID while being in the premise? This is a very good question. Um, so we've kind of covered what staff must do. No staff should be working when they're ill, so they need to be sent home. When it gets to uh, the general public coming in, uh, people should not be shopping when they're ill, period. Anyone that's positive for COVID or a close contact of the case will be followed up by our staff. And I did uh, advice to self-monitor or self-isolate. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky situation for business owners though. Um, if you see somebody that, that is visibly ill, um, 
it's it's your uh, decision at the time on what you're going to be be able to do. But you got to keep in mind that um, right now people also have allergies. So just because they are sneezing and sniffling doesn't necessarily mean that they have COVID. There's other things that are happening in a community. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, you might want to also check with your legal department or, or legal counsel to see what uh, rights you have as a, as a business owner uh, to deny people entry. Uh, we are not advising businesses that they have to deny entry uh, of, of people that are coming in. But we, we got to be careful and cognizant of one another. Face shields, should masks be worn with them? So the short answer is yes. Masks should be worn with uh, face shields to be most effective. And as I mentioned, uh, face shields are considered inferior to masks. At minimum, they should be, go below the chin and uh, to the sides of the face. And according to the World Health Organization, uh, supports they, they support the use of face shields uh, as better than nothing as an alternative in the event that an individual is not able to wear masks uh, or has some, some other uh, issues. How can we serve coffee after the game? Should one person in the uh, be in charge of making, pouring, and serving the coffee and collecting the cups and putting them in a dishwasher? Uh, so this is not necessarily just a COVID question. This is a general uh, kind of advice. Yes, whenever you have a, an activity that deals with serving food, uh, you need to break up the, the clean tasks from the dirty tasks. So the clean tasks are serving the customer, uh, preparing the food. The dirty tasks are collecting money, uh, picking up uh, used dishes, and then running them through the dishwasher. Very important to wash hands in between. So that's all I have. That's I great. Open up to additional questions. We're gonna go into uh, the question and answer section. So I am gonna run through the questions that we received in the chat box. Um, but first we do have one other question that was submitted in advance. Uh, so I'm going to touch on that one first. So Richard, the question is, what recommendations do you have for businesses who face backlash from customers about face mask policies? We have seen tragic consequences locally, and I have experienced firsthand physically abusive behavior from an individual who refused to wear a face mask. Uh, this type of reaction will be encountered in our communities. Uh, thank you very much for that question, and, and it is an important question, and I, I have been up in Halliburton uh, and in Minden, and I, I met with the uh, store owner um, that, that was involved in that unfortunate incident. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we are asking all of the businesses to inform public of the requirement to wear masks. That's where your legal obligation ends. There's no requirement for you to make anybody wear masks. So I also teach um, nonviolence crisis intervention. And one of the, the key, key principles is you can't make people do things. You can give them options and they will need to choose the, uh, you know, what they want to do but with each option comes consequences. And in this particular case, the, uh, the options are wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, but the consequences are more generic. So it's, it's um, not necessarily being uh, not allowed in, in the store because we're not asking you to not allow people in the store. We're asking uh, people to wear masks to protect themselves and everybody around them. So, it's, it's a selfish thing for, for certain individuals to do. But as business owners, um, the only thing that I can say is if you encounter anybody that doesn't wear, want to wear a mask, you just advise them that that is the requirement and that's where your, um, your obligation ends. 
if people become abusive, uh, you can always call the police. Police have been uh, very helpful uh, in assisting us and assisting businesses in, uh, in uh, various different matters. Not sure if that's... That's great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Susan Peel. Is a portable air filtration system with a HEPA filter recommended? And will it clean the air of COVID particles? So I, I haven't read up on portable filters as it relates to COVID particles, but the COVID particles are, there's, there's a lot of uh, studies that are happening right now, but the general consensus at this time is that they're uh, transmitted through droplets. So they're not generally aerosolized and the, the, the small parts that are aerosolized, I've read uh, one, one study in particular that was shared by the Medical Officer of Health, indicates that there has been no evidence of transmission of infection. So majority of the viral particles are in those droplets and those droplets uh, drop down to the ground within uh, that two meter distance. And that's why there is that, that two meter physical distance that we're talking about. If you want to add additional uh, air filtration, it's not going to hurt any, but you got to maintain it so it doesn't create any additional problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, so anyone who has questions, feel free to use the chat box. If it is your questions and you're looking for further clarification, uh, feel free to type it in there and, and we will address it. The next question is, uh, we are in an office with only one employee working in the office at a time. Our door is locked to control entry. Some days we have no clients entering. Is staff required to wear a mask when they are alone? No. Okay. No. And, and there is, um, if you go on our website under the masking requirement, there's a lot of questions that have been asked uh, similar to this. Uh, there's a number of businesses such as uh, law offices and businesses where you, public don't have uh, access to. So it's based on an individual uh, coming in, in and on an appointment kind of thing. And those businesses, the staff in those businesses are not required to wear masks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next is coming from Kat. If you are in a workplace where you've maintained physical distancing and worn masks in closer contacts or public contacts, are the other workers in the workplace considered close contacts if one person tests positive? Yes. Yes. Uh, a question about will you receive the presentation slides after the call? Yes, we will make both the recording and the presentation available. We'll post it on uh, our website and then send you all a link to where it is. Uh, another question here that we have, we've been directed to remain closed at this time as we offer drop-in programs for families. We may be permitted to start offering outdoor programming, but need to collaborate with the local health unit for protocols. Who would we contact? So you can call the 1-866-888-4577, extension 5020, which is our call center. And they'll direct you to uh, the appropriate department that will be dealing with you. We have staff that have been designated for uh, assisting uh, you know, day programs uh, and, and uh, other childcare uh, activities. Uh, so we, we will be able to assist. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we are just at 10 o'clock right now uh, and we promised you all that we would be done by 10 o'clock. Um, does anybody have any other questions? If you want to quickly throw it in the group chat, we um, put it in there. Uh, one question coming in from Margaret. We have karaoke every Friday night at the Legion. If we provide a shield between the singer and the DJ, could we have this event? 
So with respect to karaoke, uh, karaoke rooms are not allowed. Okay. Singing is allowed if it's done where there is a, a, a shield separating the individual from uh, the DJ and from everybody else. And there's a requirement for routine cleaning of uh, the equipment, such as um, the microphone, for example, in between uh, use as well. But if you want to, if, if the client uh, or the, call, the person asking the question wants to uh, touch base with uh, either myself or our inspection staff, uh, we, can, we can provide them with uh, additional guidance. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen once more with some, uh, oh, from current slide, uh, from, which is with some resources to take along with you uh, on the, oops, sorry guys. On the city's page, we have a COVID-19 business page where we list all of the sort of up-to-date policy changes and resources that are available to you. Uh, we've got a business blog that highlights some supports for you getting uh, you on the uh, sort of digital realm, getting you online and more visible online. And then every week, our team sends out a business newsletter. So one of the ways is uh, we use that for promoting events such as these and all of the up-to-date information that's coming out from the health unit and the provincial and federal governments as well. And that comes out on a weekly basis. Uh, it would be great if you're not already subscribed to it. To, it's a great uh, way for you to stay involved in the economic recovery efforts of the city. Uh, and Sandy, uh, my colleague, is just going to put up a quick poll for you uh, just to get some feedback on this session for you. And while she's doing that, I will just put a plug in. Uh, Richard is joining us again tomorrow morning for another session that's specifically targeted for restaurants, uh, entertainment and event venues. So uh, if you haven't uh, registered for that and, uh, and fit within one of those categories or are interested in sitting in, it's happening tomorrow morning, again at nine o'clock from nine until 10. And then also happening tomorrow, uh, our SBEC team is uh, having a session in the afternoon uh, at one o'clock, I believe, on doing business in 2020. So starting or expanding your business sort of under the current conditions. Uh, so if you're interested in that as well, I believe Sandy put some information uh, at the top of the chat group. Uh, if you're interested in joining that, she would love to host you for that. And if there are not uh, any other questions, then um, once you've had a chance to complete the poll, I thank you for that. And again, thank you all for taking an hour out of your morning to join us and uh, join Richard. Thank you to the Chambers and the BIA for helping coordinate this. It's been a great opportunity for us to connect with you and bring you uh, what we hope is really relevant information that you need to make sure that you feel safe uh, for yourself, your staff, and your customers in reopening. Uh, and those of you who are going to join us tomorrow, then uh, it'll be a pleasure to see you again tomorrow morning. If you do have any other questions uh, and didn't get a chance to ask them this morning or it comes to you after the fact, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, I will collate them and send them off to Richard. And I'll just put my email in the chat box for anybody who doesn't have it. Uh, and with that, uh, I will say thank you again, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Richard.